Hello, everyone. Um, my name's Matt, for those that don't know me. Um, one thing I would say is that this is the first time I've ever used Keynote. Apparently, I don't have PowerPoint on my laptop anymore, so <laughs> this could go very wrong, but I'll do my best. Um, so, um, I'm a senior associate at JP Morgan Chase. Um, I joined back in 2019, the tail end, um, and since then I've been working on the continuous delivery team um, within JET. So JET is our developer tool chain internally. Um, I'm now a technical lead within that team. Um, I'm also on the technical oversight committee for the Spinnaker project, um, and I'll echo what the DC said earlier. Um, there's a TOC open meeting today at lunchtime, so if you want to come and chat to us about Spinnaker um, and what we're doing, um, please do. Um, the other thing I've been told I have to say is that these are my own views, they're not the views of JP Morgan Chase, standard <laughs> disclaimer. Um, I don't think I'm going to say anything particularly controversial today, but you never know. So, um, a brief intro to our deployment landscape at JPMC. So, one of the figures that media like us to say is that we have more than 6,000 application teams um, across the firm, so there's 50,000 technologists. Um, we've, we're using Spinnaker as our public cloud and private cloud deployment tool, um, so various different endpoints. Um, I gave a variation of this slide last year, um, at which point we were at around 50,000 deployments a month. We're now at well over 400,000 a month, um, so that's you know, 600% increase year on year, uh, and we're still growing. So we're still very much in an adoption phase, scaling Spinnaker, getting its critical mass. Um, so within Spinnaker, you know, we've got well over 6,000 applications, probably twice that at least, um, 50,000 plus pipelines. Um, yeah, and as I said, we're, we're running at massive scale now. Um, obviously, being an investment bank globally, um, regulation becomes very important for us. Um, there's some logos on here, but I lost my speaker notes, so I can't remember all of their names. Um, but we have the European Central Bank, the Financial Conduct Authority back in the UK, uh, the SEC in the US, uh, there's BaFin, which I believe is the German regulator, um, OSFI, I think is the Canadian one. Um, and this list is not anywhere near exhaustive. Right? We're talking tens, if not hundreds, of regulators across the globe. Um, but these are the ones I'm at least familiar with. Um, so when we're deploying software, we get asked different things by all of these different organizations to prove that we're doing it in a safe way. Um, and we can evidence that if it comes to an audit. Right? So it's very important for our team that any tooling we use um, enables us to have that traceability of what's going on. So that's where OPA has come in. So Open Policy Agent. Um, I'm sure many of you in here are familiar with OPA as a project, but for those that don't know, it's a CNCF graduated tool. Um, it's probably most commonly known as a Kubernetes admission controller. So if you've ever tried to apply a manifest to Kubernetes and you've got back a, um, is it, denied by admission control or something like that. That's probably OPA in the background doing its thing. Um, but the nice thing about it is it's flexible enough to essentially work on any uh, integration you want, right? So it's very good for Kubernetes, but it can also be used in a variety of different ways. Um, and essentially how it works is you have a programming language or a policy language known as Rago, um, which is built on top of data log with some additional things to handle JSON. Um, and essentially, you give it an input, um, and you can write your policy to work through that input and work out if something should be denied or allowed. Um, and because it's so flexible, that makes it very powerful for us to be able to work on any kind of JSON input that we want to enforce policy on. Um, so as I mentioned, we use Spinnaker for our cloud deployments. Um, this is an example of what that can look like in Spinnaker, so the red error box of doom. Um, that people see when their pipeline fails. Um, so we have that integration there. So you can see the error message from OPA here. You know, foo does not in fact equal bar. Um, but you know, in reality, that could be any number of different things that we block pipelines based on 
you know, a developer doing something wrong or misconfiguration or so on. So I want to walk through a couple of hypothetical slash not so hypothetical scenarios around things we enforce. Um, and then I'll kind of explain how that can be enforced in OPA. Um, what you usually find is it's very simple. Um, so we can see here the first kind of obvious thing that you want to think about when deploying, right? Um, when you're doing a production deployment, you don't want to use a Highlander strategy most of the time. So for those that don't know, the Highlander strategy essentially deploys your new version and then purges the old version. So what that means is you then have nothing to roll back to if there's an issue. You have to redeploy the old version. Um, and when you're working at a company like JPMC, where you know a production issue could be costing millions of dollars a minute, um, having nothing to roll back to is a very bad place to be. Um, so what we can do in OPA is we can say, if this is a deployment to production, you can't use Highlander. You have to use blue-green. And an example of that is here. Hopefully you can read that. Um, but it's essentially four lines of Rego code in OPA, right? So at the top, there's a line that says, the Highlander strategy is not permitted for use in production. And that's the error message that users will see in that red box if this policy fails. Um, and then we have four lines of code, right? So the first is kind of boilerplate. We're extracting some information out of the Spinnaker payload. Um, the second, we're checking if it's a production account. Um, this is kind of not as easy as it looks in practice, but for this example, let's pretend all production accounts end in dash prod. Um, in reality, maybe they don't, but we'll see. Um, and then these last two lines are kind of really the crux of this policy, right? So if a traffic management policy in Spinnaker is being used, so equals equals true, and if that strategy is Highlander, then we've reached the end of this decision block and this deny block will return true. So this is the thing that trips people up with Oprah a lot of the time. You have to kind of reverse your thinking. Um, so here, all of these things have returned true, so we're going to deny. It's not one of these things has failed, so we're going to deny. Um, and that can get very confusing with more complicated policies, and you really have to think through what you're trying to do. So if any of these lines returns false, um, or for example, input.stage.context doesn't evaluate to anything, that line will just fail and this policy won't return. So you have to be very careful around designing these and writing these to make sure that they're resilient to all different edge cases. So the second scenario, um, which people might have come across before, this isn't anything groundbreaking. Um, if you're deploying a container image, deploy it by the SHA-256 digest, not the tag. Um, and the rationale here, right, is pretty obvious. A tag isn't necessarily immutable. So if you've uploaded your artifact to Artifactory or whatever container registry you're using, and you've tagged it, let's say, latest, and then you deploy that to production, and then a new build comes along, uploads the same, a different image to the same tag, it's overwritten, and then one of your Kubernetes nodes goes down, pods get rescheduled, the new image is pulled, but you don't know that that new image has been deployed. The only way to avoid that is to use a digest, which is actually immutable. So if you, by doing this, you're essentially ensuring that when you approve an image for release, that is the image that's going to be deployed. And again, in OPA, this isn't too complicated. This is slightly longer um, than what we've seen. But again, same first line of boilerplate. Um, and then we essentially jump into a for loop. So for some manifest in the manifests that are being deployed, we're going to check all of these rules. And if any of these return true, then the entire deny block will return true. And the next thing we have to do is kind of annoying, right? So if you have a Kubernetes manifest, it's not necessarily that all of, not, not certain that all of the images are all going to be in the containers field, right? You could have init containers in your manifest if it's a deployment, for example. So we have to get all of the containers first, and then we have to get all of the images from those containers. So this uh, square brace underscore is essentially an iterator. Uh, and then we do another loop through all of the images that we found in those manifests, 
and using this incredibly complicated fancy regex that I pulled from the Google Cloud Docs, um, we can check if it's a digest. Um, and if it's not a digest, and again, this is the thing that trips people up, that you have to invert everything you're doing. Um, we print this error message, image, blah, must be using a digest, not a tag. And that's what they see in Spinnaker. And then, final example I want to give um, is artifacts to be deployed to production must have been tested. So SBOMs is kind of a buzzword that's come up um, recently. It's the new big thing in software delivery. Um, and we're no exception to that. Um, it's really important that anything we're deploying, we can prove that it's been tested. Because if we get audited and we've released something to production and there's no test evidence that it was actually tested and customers lose money, that's a really bad thing for us to go through. So, you know, many, many regulators now require us to essentially prove that SDLC best practices have been adhered to. Um, and as part of our deployment pipelines, we can enforce that. So let's say, hypothetically, we have an API that returns true or false if something has been tested or not. Um, the first three, four lines of this are exactly the same as what we just walked through a second ago. Um, I've just cut them out because it's boilerplate. So we collect all of the manifests um, being deployed in the stage. We collect all of the images being deployed in those manifests. And then we make a HTTP call. And this is where OPA can really be flexible with what you're doing. You can make external calls to APIs and things like that. Um, so now we can check. We can send all of these images to this API. And if it returns false, then we can deny the uh, deny the deployment. And this all happens at runtime. So the user executes their pipeline in Spinnaker, it gets to the deploy stage, and we stop it at that point because we don't think it's safe to release. Um, and we usually give them some actual information about what's going on rather than just saying denied. But, you know. So where are we going with this in future, right? So what I've talked about so far are policies that we as the continuous delivery team have written. Um, obviously, we can't spend our lives accounting for every single variation all of our different lines of business have. So the International Consumer Bank, um, Chase, you might be familiar with in the US, you know, our investment bank, our asset and wealth management, they might all have different requirements and audit requirements for deployments. So what we want to do is empower people to write their own policies um, and scope those to the teams that uh, need to enforce them. So I have some examples here, right? So let's say as the engineering manager for Team X, I need all of my production pipelines to run between 10 and 18 UTC because um, that's when people are online. That's when they can log in to troubleshoot issues. Or as an auditor for Chase, I need all of my pipelines to have a post-deployment testing step, so load testing or stress testing or something, so because regulator Y have said that I have to do that. But that doesn't necessarily apply to the HR technology team that are building some desk booking tool, right? For example, that's not an audit requirement. So how can we scope these policies to be specific to teams that actually need to implement them? Um, also, the other thing we're really looking at is um, testing and valid validating that these policies are good. Um, so OPA has a, the OPA CLI has like a test command. You can write unit tests for OPA policies. Um, so how do we build out a tool chain allowing us to test that these policies are valid, that they're not just gonna start blocking the 400,000 appointments a month arbitrarily and cause a major issue for us? Um, and how do we make this dynamic, right? We don't want to get into a situation where the Chase team come to us and say, we need this policy, can you do it for us? And we say, sure, Q2 next year, we'll get around to writing this policy for you and releasing it. We want this to be self-service, right? So how can they upload these policies themselves? How can we validate that they're going to work, enforce test cases, and how do we scope them? That's really where we're going with this. Um, and the other thing to note, right, we just leads nicely onto what we just talked about with interoperability of tooling is how do we make these policies not Spinnaker specific? So the policies we've looked at today um, are quite reliant on the format of data that Spinnaker is sending to the policies. 
how do we make these generic enough that if we want to roll out Argo or Harness or any other tool tomorrow, right? How do we make these, these policies generic enough that we don't have to go and rewrite all 150 policies through another tool? So that's, that's kind of a whistle-stop tour of policy enforcement and continuous delivery. Um, I think I've got five minutes left. Um, so if anyone has any questions, feel free. Um, I'd shout out a plug for uh, my colleague Jamie's talk, which is tomorrow. Um, he's going to be talking about adoption. Um, so if you're interested in knowing how we've gone from 50K deployments to 450K deployments in a year, definitely go check that out. Um, and again, spinnaker a TOC in, I think, like an hour. Um, but yeah, that's it. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I don't think there's been anything show-stopping so far. There's been cases where policies we want to implement have been quite difficult to express in Rego. So, for example, if you, have, if you have something that needs you to call a couple of APIs, it can get quite messy to have multiple HTTP send calls in a single policy because I think up until recently, Opa was single-threaded, so it became blocking and an issue. Um, so what we've done in some cases, built out an API that OPA can call and return the decision, but that's few and far between. That's only a couple of places. Um, you know, and the, the really cool thing about OPA is it's really performant, right? So we are by no means experts in Rego or OPA and performance tuning, but we've got, you know, 100 plus policies in place for every execution, and we're seeing response times less than 50 milliseconds, right? That's Pretty awesome. Sure. Follow up to that performance widget we do have performance issues with that once it gets bigger and um, any tips and tricks? Like are you, are you paralyzing have multiple over servers and stuff like that? What is your policy distribution Yeah, so I don't know about sharding of OPA, but we definitely have more than one replica. Um, I think one one of the things that one of the uh, the drawbacks of OPA is the iteration that can potentially become a bottleneck. So I showed a couple of examples here, right, of we're iterating through all of these manifests and then iterating through all of the images. Um, OPA doesn't particularly like doing lots of iteration. As I mentioned, it's single-threaded, so it just gets stuck. Um, but, yeah, we haven't really run into any, like, performance issues. It's kind of just been sitting there working um, since we released it a couple of years ago. Um, and compared to other things we have to operate around Spinnaker, it's like way down the list of, it just works. So is it co-located with Spinnaker or where is it running? Uh, we have it running in the same Kubernetes cluster as Spinnaker. David? So the question for those who don't know is um, Spinnaker essentially stores an execution or a pipeline run as a JSON blob that gets put into a database. Um, and David's asking how big that gets for us. Um, we have run into issues with that semi-recently. Um, we've, had, we've had cases where some of our large clients have done some interesting things with their pipelines that have caused us issues. Um, we haven't yet adopted Artifact Store. We are looking to do it as soon as possible, but we're a bit behind on versions at the moment. So we're, we're working our way towards it, and it will definitely be turning it on, as well as your nifty little compression okay. feature as well. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had any So I don't think we've had any particular issues with upgrading. It's pretty good about being backwards compatible. Um, there's been cases where new features have been released in the language. So for example, this sum thing that I've shown in this line three, 
um, is relatively new. Um, so it used to be a bit more verbose about iterating. Um, so there's been some improvements there. But I mean, in general, it's, it's been pretty backwards compatible. I don't think we've run into any issues with upgrading. Um, we're usually pretty free flowing about that. All right. Cool. Good. All good. Cheers. Thank Thanks, everyone.